Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Bob Raines, the coordinator of the Honors <coughs> Program here at Jackson State. Um, on behalf of the Honors Program and our, and our co-sponsors, I want to thank you for coming this afternoon. Maybe we could all take just a minute to check our cell phones and make sure that they are on a, kind of a silent mode. I'll try to do that as well. Um, it's an honor to have the opportunity to collaborate with the Equal Justice Initiative, an organization doing important, meaningful work, and with the president of the local NAACP branch, uh, Mr. Harold Carter, uh, and Ms. Amir Graves, the advisor um, for the Lane College chapter of the NAACP. It's been a pleasure getting to know you folks, and um, I'm sorry about all of my obsessive emails over the last two months. Uh, the list of other people to thank is just so long, and I have listed their names in the back of the program, so please take a look at that. Why does it matter what happened in our community over 100 years ago, and why should we talk about it? Our history tells us who we are, and our story is complicated. It's the background or context for our current and oftentimes difficult conversations about legal, economic, and social justice. It helps us understand what is at stake for so many people in our discourse about our criminal justice system, the death penalty, Civil War monuments, flags, slogans, and even immigration. As a society, we suffered a deep moral injury from which we have never fully recovered, slavery and its aftermath. Over 4,000 lynchings took place in the South between 1870 and 1950. There were 233 documented lynchings in our state. Half of those occurred in West Tennessee. Brian Stevenson, founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, says that we are all burdened by this history. Lynching reinforced a legacy of racial inequality that has never been adequately addressed in America. You cannot have reconciliation without empathy, and you cannot have empathy unless people learn, know, and understand the pain that informs our present and hobbles our future. Brian Stevenson is a wise man. So I think a first but crucial step toward atonement, reconciliation, and maybe even some bit of redemption is truth-telling, and accounting or reckoning with the past. Owning our weaknesses, our mistakes, and even shameful parts of our history can be healing. It makes us stronger, healthier, and more whole. Today we are here to own this history and to honor the memory of these three people who were denied their basic protections and privileges under our Constitution. They were victims of a savage brutality. Sadly, we do not know very much about these people and their lives, but we do know about their tragic deaths. We need to say their names. Eliza Woods. Thank you. John Brown. Frank Ballard. And we, did, and we need to say that their lives mattered. The Equal Justice Initiative is opening a museum and a memorial to lynching victims this spring in Montgomery, Alabama. They're collecting soil from lynching sites across the South. This soil, which we took from our courthouse lawn, the site of two of the lynchings, will become a part of the museum's collection. So in an effort to save a little bit of time this afternoon, because we have several speakers, uh, what I thought I would do is I'm just going to go through the list and introduce all of the participants. Um, and as your turn comes up, if you will just come to the podium, that'll, that'll make this a little simpler for all of us, I think. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge uh, my friend James Mayo, who composed and performed that opening piece of music. Um, Uh, James is an associate professor of English here at Jackson State. Um, Harold Carter uh, is the president of the Jackson Madison County branch of the NAACP. Um, Esther Gray Lemus is the director of the Jackson State Vocal Ensemble Innovation, and they're going to perform for you. Um, Ms. Amira Graves is the advisor of the Lane College chapter of the NAACP. Um, Erica Webster is also a student uh, at Lane College. James Cherry is an accomplished writer-poet. Uh, James has composed a poem for this occasion. Um, Jody Pickens is the Attorney General 
attorney general for our district. Um, Richard Donnell is an attorney and the legal advisor to the president of Lane College. Mary Ann Poe is the dean of the School of Social Work at Union University. Shannon Johnson is a JSCC graduate and current student at Lane College. Uh, we hope that Ms. Johnny Turner, I see that she is here, thank you, <laughs> glad you're here, Ms. Turner, state representative and sponsor of the bill authorizing the investigation of civil rights era cold cases. Um, a little footnote here, um, Ms. Turner participated in the 1963 March on Washington. Um, Reverend Daryl Coleman is the pastor at Mother Liberty CME Church. At the conclusion of our ceremony, anyone who would like to place soil into the jars, which will be taken to the Equal Justice Initiative's National Museum for Peace and Justice, will be invited to do so. So, thank you again for being here. And I will now invite Mr. Carter to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Raines, and thanks to uh, Jackson State Community College for all that it does in our community. Uh, Dr. Hammonds, you've got a tremendous team here. Um, it's always willing to re reach out into the community and do wonderful things. This day's occasion is one that we all should remember, not because it's just an event, but because it is history that has been written. The 4,000 or so victims that we have identified across the South it's just a small number of those individuals that we can, we can certify that it happened. There was many more that was lynched in this county and in this state and in this part of the country, far more than what you would see on that, that paper. One of the things that I want to recognize too is that as Dr. Raines, and Dr. Raines and Jackson State have done a tremendous job of inviting us to participate in this because we both attended the uh, ceremonies over in Alamo, Tennessee not too long ago. And what a beautiful job that they did there. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity to recognize the issues of the past and to bring forth an understanding of what took place, why it took place. And this is something that unfortunately that we're not learning too much of today, our history. It is all of our history, black and white that we remember what happened in the past so we can move on with a sensible dialogue and understanding how to fix it. A lot of our problems is because of what took place hundreds of years ago from 1619 up until 1969 when slavery officially ended with sharecropping. That history needs to be taught in our schools to our children so they don't repeat the same mistakes that we have made. I want to recognize too that the young people that are here, this is your history. This is your history as well, whether you're black or white, whether you're other ethnicities. If you're here in America and the Americans your home, this is your history. Know it, don't be afraid of it. Because unfortunately your adults have, have not done a good job of teaching you that. And we all have a part to play in this. Everybody's hands dirty in that one. But let us remember that this is an opportunity to really not to correct the wrongs that have done, but to recognize it for what it is and let's move on from there. Uh, Dr. Raines and I have been talking about another project, and Dr. Raines, I hope you don't mind if I say this. We thought of a few years back, and they have along a similar track, of having what we call a, a listening opportunity for those to tell their story in our times. Reaching back to those that have aged now, that have some remembrance of that, some recollection of what took place back in the days of segregation, etc. Those stories that they have heard from a local perspective. So that project should be hopefully up and running at some point in time in the near future. In other words, what we're doing is asking you or to ask your grandparents, those that are still alive, to get their stories about what took place when they were alive. And then we can forever preserve that. Uh, recognition of who we are as a people, who we are as a, as a, as a, as a nation is very important, particularly in these days and times. Let me recognize those of the elected officials that are here, those that kind of steer us in the government relationship. Do I have 
anyone here, I know that Mr. Pickens is here, he operates the District Attorney General's office. Is there anyone else here that does recognize you? Daryl Hubbard, uh, City Court Clerk. Uh, Katie Brantley is the uh, County Commissioner. Uh, Senator Ed Jackson is here from all the way from uh, Nashville, makes his home here and, and serves in office. And uh, Ms. John Turner, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Raines has indicated, she is here. What a fighter she is. She's worked in civil rights for a number of years as the director of our NACP over in Memphis. Uh, she worked with her husband who, who died, and uh, she took his place as a state representative and done a marvelous job. Uh, these are the examples that we all should be proud of. Uh, there are so many others that I can recognize here, but those of you that are in the positions, whether you're uh, leaders elected or whether or not you're just a father and a mother or a grandparent, Take heed to our past. Understand where we are and where we must go to be successful. I thank all of you for your support and all of your endeavors in leading us toward a very brighter future. Thank you.
That is so very lovely. I enjoy you all as much as I do Lane College's concert choir. <laughs> please, I cannot leave this room. <laughs> Edit that out, please, <laughs> Madam Reporter. Thank you. Uh, once again, I'm Amira Graves, college historian at Lane College and the advisor for the Lane College chapter of the NAACP. And my thanks to Dr. Raines for his outstanding work in putting this together. And thank you, Dr. Raines, for inviting the participation of our Lane College chapter. Uh, thank you, President Hammond, for allowing us to be here and embracing this effort. On November 12, 1882, Lane College opened as the CME High School and had 27 students enrolled. In the first decades of its existence, Lane is said to have almost completely wiped out illiteracy in West Tennessee. However, the early accomplishments of Lane College were carried out amidst a troubling trend of racial violence known as lynching. Lynching was a popular way of punishing African Americans who were wrongly accused of a crime in order to impose fear upon them as they went about day to day life. Lynching was often carried out in the form of the hanging of a black person by a vicious white mob of attackers. Blacks voting and increased progress could trigger the increase of lynching incidents in a community so as to warn blacks to stay in their place. Less than three years after Lane first opened for classes, Eliza Woods, a black woman, was lynched right here in Jackson. She was accused of poisoning and killing her white employer's wife. A crowd of a thousand was reportedly present when this black woman, Eliza Woods, was dragged from the jail and hanged naked in front of the Jackson courthouse. Bullets were then shot into her naked body. In 1889, Wood's employer confessed that he had killed his wife. The case was written about by Ida B. Wells, a black woman journalist, activist, and co-founder of the NAACP, which constantly spoke out against lynching. By this time, Lane had graduated its first class and built its first library. The practice of lynching would continue into the 20th century, and Emmett Till would become the most famous lynching victim in U.S. history. This 14-year-old African-American boy was accused of whistling and making sexual advances at a white woman in Mississippi in 1955. Just a few days, or in recent news, Accounts of the case revealed that Till's accuser lied about Emmett Till's actions towards her. The establishment of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which is what the letters NAACP stand for, in 1909 was motivated largely by the pervasiveness of lynching of African Americans in the South and the need for legislation that would make lynching a federal crime and mandate appropriate punishment of those who committed these acts of murder. The NAACP conducted investigations of lynchings and race riots in the South and reported its findings in its publication, The Crisis. In Washington on Capitol Hill, the NAACP fought a tedious battle to achieve passage of anti-lynching legislation. After much persistence, it gained the support of Representative Leonidas C. Dyer of Missouri, who introduced H.R. 
11279 on April 18, 1918. This proposed legislation stated, its purpose was to protect citizens of the United States against lynching in default of protection by the states. A decade long effort to get this bill passed ensued, but ended in defeat. However, the NAACP drew increased support for the cause against <coughs> lynching in the sphere of public opinion. Thanks to the writings and activism of NAACP leaders such as Walter White and James Weldon Johnson, and yes, Ida B. Wells. When one of her friends and his business partners were lynched after defending themselves against a white mob that attacked them because they opened up a grocery store that drew customers away from the white-owned store in Memphis, Ida B. Wells began her crusade against lynching. Much of what is known about the lynching tragedies of the late 1800s is due to the work of Ida B. Wells. Wells accomplished the remarkable feat of becoming a teacher, business owner, and investigative journalist despite the fact that she was born into a system of slavery in Holy, Holly Springs, Mississippi on July 16, 1862. Ida B. Wells wrote about the injustice of lynching in two newspapers that she established in Memphis, Tennessee. One of these publications was called the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight, and the other was called Free Speech. In response to one of the anti-lynching editorials that Ida B. Wells wrote, a mob of angry white men stormed the office of her newspaper and destroyed all of her equipment. At the time, Wells had been frequently traveling to New York City. She was warned that if she ever returned to Memphis, she would be killed. Refusing to stop speaking out against lynching, Ida B. Wells took her anti-lynching campaign to the White House when in 1898 she led a protest in Washington, D.C. and called for President William McKinley to make reforms. In 1909, she became one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, otherwise known as the NAACP. She called for President Woodrow Wilson to put an end to discriminatory practice, hiring practices for government jobs and urged him to support legislation that would make lynching a federal crime. Death threats were constant, but Ida B. Wells refused to stop fighting against racism through her writings, speeches, and protests. She once said, I felt that one had better die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or a rat in a trap. Good afternoon. Um, doing my research on uh, Eliza Woods, I found that uh, some places spelled her name with an S and some w without an S, so uh, that's not a misprint in your program. Um, she was a uh, 55 year old domestic worker here in Madison County, and as Miss Graves has explained, uh, she was accused of poisoning her employer, uh, Miss Jessie Woolen. Uh, one of the things that was common at lynching sites was that uh, the mob made its black citizens attend these events uh, to instill fear into them. And so this is my offering for uh, Eliza Wood, uh, Jackson, Tennessee, August 18th, 1886. Most nights you can find Eliza Wood downtown sitting on the base of the monument to the Confederate dead, digging into the dirt under the moonlight, excavating the earth for a relic of justice. Speak her name, she'll raise her head, 
Scan the horizon that swallows your voice with a cacophony of curses, rebel yells, shotgun blasts that leave exit wounds in the sky. Sheriff Person and his men could not protect you, Eliza, from other men with torches, flashes of bloodlust in their eye, from ripping the clothes off your back and driving you from a jail cell into the August night. The carnival had come to town. Kids cartwheeled the stars, women jostled babies on their hips and reminisced about the last carnival. Men slobbered a flask between them and music square dance from a downtown building. Did you recognize many other faces, Eliza? Black faces made to assemble and bow to a history of degradation and fear. Lessons taught from a crumbled constitution in the hands of Jim Crow. Forced to confess, poisoning Miss Jessie, you spoke silence, would not be the last to be slapped, spat upon, driven from one place of judgment to another. Your sex would not save you, the color of blackness, unforgivable. Your flesh bruised along cobblestones, scraped from Jackson streets, strangled by a noose and nailed to a tree. Gunshots found your body, the mob roared, the night dissipated. In the morning, makeshift gray clothes entombed you. Shafts of sunlight filtered your remains, cast shadows on the silver crucifix, trampled in the broken earth. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Dr. Bob Rains and Jackson State Community College and, and those that maybe have not been mentioned here today who have had a hand in putting together what I believe is a very fitting and appropriate ceremony. Uh, Dr. Rains asked me to share my thoughts here today's ceremony. And knowing lawyer, how lawyers might be, he limited me to five minutes. <laughs> I'll try to live with that. Uh, when he first asked me to come speak, and uh, I was really uh, struggled with a little bit of what I might say to a group assembled, as he stated to you that uh, I'm the uh, district attorney general, and no doubt at the time that these incidents occurred that we're all discussing here today, there was somebody in the position that I held, and I can only presume that nothing was done. Dr. Raines gave me the overall theme of race and justice. And I began to think about that against the backdrop of the stain that lynching is on our history, particularly on our community. We had the shame of having three of those here in Madison County, the latest, the latest in 1894. You know, as a human being, the thought of what was done to the victims of lynching is sickening. I can tell you as an attorney, lynching represents a repudiation of what I and many others have dedicated our lives to, and that is the rule of law. In this country, the Constitution guarantees all of us certain rights, whether they be black or white. The right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. The right to a trial by jury. The right to confront and cross-examine witnesses against us. And the right to basic due process. Sadly, those rights that we are all entitled to, that we enjoy, were not offered, no, were not protected for each of these victims. You know, without the protection, without the protections that are set forth in our Constitution, people of color were murdered, in the process often tortured, based upon allegations that even if they were proven true, would not be a violation of the criminal law, violations of the moral code. 
Nowhere is that written. But yet, often they were pulled from their homes, they were pulled from a jail cell, and they were murdered and they were tortured. You know, preparing today's ceremony, my mind was drawn to an old story that I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, read or seen portrayed in a movie. And that's uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And that was uh, a timeless novel that we all read in probably grade school or college, written by Harper Lee. Uh, and if you recall, uh, that novel was set in rural Alabama in 1930, in the 1930s. Um, you know, sometime after the last incident we had here in Madison County. The story largely surrounds the plight of Tom Robinson, who was a poor black, poor black man who was accused of uh, raping a white woman. And it also surrounds Atticus Finch, who was a prominent white attorney who was appointed to represent Tom Robinson. The case was thought to be so abhorrent to the people in that community. No one would take the case. Atticus Finch had to be appointed to represent him. He took on that burden. You know, and I'm, I'm a prosecutor, and Atticus Finch is a defense attorney. But it's not hard for me to say that Atticus Finch has always been a hero of mine. Yeah. Okay? And in a scene in that movie that really sums up what, when I think about race and justice, Atticus Finch kind of, he, he gives this statement. And if you can maybe recall the scene uh, in the movie, if you, if, you, if you had the chance to see that, and if you haven't, I recommend it. But at the time, Atticus Finch, he, he rises to give his summation, his closing argument. And he's asking for the, for the life of his client, who we all know is innocent. And you can set the scene. It's set in that old rural <coughs> courthouse, no air conditioning, the whites on the ground floor, the blacks in the balcony, everyone's sweating. sweating. They're fanning themselves. And he rises up and he says something. And this is a quote. He says, but in this country, in this one way, this country, in which all men are created equal, there's one human institution that makes a pauper the equal of a Rockefeller, the stupid man the equal of Einstein, and the ignorant man the equal of any college president. That institution, gentlemen, is a court. It can be the United States Supreme Court, or the humblest justice of the peace court in the land, or this honorable court in which you serve. Our courts have their faults, as does any human institution. But in this country, our courts are the great levelers. In our courts, all men are created equal. He says, I'm no idealist to believe, that, believe firmly in the integrity of our courts and of our jury system. That is no ideal to me. This is a living, working reality. Now as I move to my seat, I would say, I'd like to say that there are people that may criticize this gathering here today. And say that you're living in the past. That you're looking at life through the rearview mirror. And I would say to them that you never move past something until you first acknowledge it. Perhaps you like me. I have a famous, well, famous, I have a favorite Bible verse, and I hate to quote it here in front of Pastor Colvin. <laughs> but it's perhaps my favorite verse in the Bible. And it's uh, found in Proverbs 24th chapter in the 24th verse. And depending on your, your translation, it says this, To those that say to the guilty, you are innocent, the nation shall rebuke you. But praises shall be heaped upon those who convict the guilty. Now today, the passage of time, our last one was here in 1894. The passage of time has probably robbed us from the ability to say to those who are guilty of these crimes, you're guilty. But by this gathering here today, we all say that we rebuke this. Gatherings today, like 
like today should remind us something that we aspire to and that's something that I believe is a living, breathing reality is that the doors, the doors of the courthouse are like the doors of a church. They should be and are open to everyone. Thank you for your time and for allowing me to be here with you today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here for these next few minutes to speak to you. And I would like to also thank Bob and all others here at Jackson State Community College for pausing to remember this day. The Bible tells us in the book of Joshua that the children of the Israelites had been in the had been in Egypt under bondage, under Pharaoh for centuries, and that they finally left Egypt. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And at the end of that 40 years, they were led by Joshua to the Promised Land. While preparing to cross the River Jordan to enter into the Promised Land, Joshua stopped them and told 12 men to stop in the middle of the River Jordan and to pick up 12 stones. And with those 12 stones, you carry them across the Jordan River and you place them as a, at a designated place. And he further said that when your children ask you why are these stones here? What do they mean? You tell your children this. Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry ground. Yes, God, your God, dried up the Jordan waters for you until you had crossed. They will remember this and not forget. From 1619 to 1865, some 246 years. The ownership of Africans in America was legal and protected by law. Not until the passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865 was slavery de jure abolished. As previously stated by Bob and by Harold in their remarks, between 1877 and 1950, some 73 years, there were 233 documented lynchings or murders in Tennessee and more than 4,000 lynchings throughout the South that averages out to four lynchings per month, one lynching per week. Eliza Wood, John Brown, and Frank Ballard were three of those 4,000. Lynchings were so prevalent that Abel Maripal, our white Jewish brother, who after seeing the haunting pictures of two young black boys in Indiana with nooses around their necks swinging gently in the wind, he penned the lyrics of the iconic song immortalized by singer Billie Holiday in a song called Strange Fruit. She said, and he said, southern trees bear strange fruit. Blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth. Scent of magnolia, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck. Strange fruit standing and laying and hanging from the trees to rot 
here's the strange and bitter crop. We can't do anything now to restore life to Eliza Wood or to John Brown or to Frank Ballard. That's beyond the power of mortal men and women. But what we can do today is to remember them. Like the children of Israel, we too can stop at the river of history and pick up the stones of injustice and convert them to the stones of justice and equality by coming together, working together, praying together, staying together, listening together, planning together, living together, and dying together. And when we place these converted stones of justice on the hill of reconciliation and love, then when our children ask us, why are these stones here? We can tell them that on this day, February 23rd, 2018, at Jackson State Community College, a group of citizens, black and white, old and young, rich and poor, Protestant and Catholic, Jews, Gentiles, Muslims, and non-believers, Asians and Hispanics, all of us, we came together and remembered those to whom justice was denied. And also by placing these converted stones here, we also remember of our God that through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come to us grace that brought us safe thus far and grace will leave us home. Thank you. I want to add my thanks to Dr. Bob Brains and Jackson State and Mr. Harold Carter and the NAACP for offering me the privilege of being a part of this memorial service today. I appreciate their leadership and our community in helping us to grapple with the part of our past that's laden with this injustice. I also want to thank the Equal Justice Initiative and their efforts nationwide that arouses, that's arousing the national conscience and leading us more toward, leading us toward a more just response to the racism and bigotry of the past, but also their efforts to help us as we move toward a more just future. I remember, as all of you probably do, the fateful day of September 11, 2001, when the U.S. was attacked by terrorists resulting in over 3,000 people killed, innocent victims. The nation was horrified at this act of cruelty. We declared a war on terror. We rallied to erect memorials. We swore to never forget that loss and committed ourselves anew to the importance of standing for the freedom and justice enshrined in our constitutional documents. In order to fight this war on terror, we created and funded the Department of Homeland Security. We engaged in combat in foreign arenas to track down those who would do us harm, and we tightened security within our own borders. Ground Zero became a memorial in New York City to remind us of that fateful day and the tragedy and loss and grief that it caused, and to rally our spirit to advance the cause of justice across the globe. The Equal Justice Initiative is helping us finally, finally to declare war on the terror of racism and bigotry that has done harm for so long and to so many of our citizens. It's taken far too long and much too much harm has been done to an entire group of our citizens because of our failure to acknowledge the wrongs commit, committed and to remember the victims. For me, the irony of the national response to one kind of terror compared with almost total lack of response to the terror inflicted on black Americans over decades and decades of slavery, then Jim Crow and segregation and now waves of racism and bigotry that persist today in perhaps more subtle and indirect ways, that irony is profound. 
those whom we recognize today, Eliza Woods, John Brown, Frank Ballard, gave the ultimate sacrifice in this heretofore undeclared war on terror. But they emerge today as representatives of the many more victims of the carnage of the terror of racism and bigotry on our own soil, including those who died and those who carried the wounds of terror in other ways. The victims of our own homegrown domestic terror, both historic and current, have been forced into this war with terror. They've lived with us and they've endured the terror mostly in silence, or rather silenced by, the majority who've not acknowledged their culpability in the oppression or even the existence of the terror. I believe that white Americans need to look at this terror in our history, which we've inflicted on our own black <coughs> population, and try to understand the pain and the suffering of these wounds. I cannot know what that terror has been but I can strive to understand, to remember, to acknowledge, to confess, and to repair what has been done with an aim to eradicate any vestiges of the racism and bigotry that sustains it still. As a follower of Jesus, I'm reminded of his call on my life to take up his cross and follow him. In some ways, the cross was the Roman Empire's version of the American lynching tree. This in part means that I am called to live in this world as he did, entering into the suffering and pain of this world and demonstrating his love, the only real durable and liberating power in the world. Dr. King once said that love in society is named justice. If we are ever to experience racial healing, and justice in this nation, we have to keep remembering and retelling the stories of racial injustice, <coughs> acknowledging and exposing racism and bigotry when and as often as we see it, honoring those who stand against it, and advocating for justice. Thank you. And let's work together.
Mr. Donnell, I have to admit, you and I are on the same wavelength. You'll see what I mean. <laughs> In 1936, 50 years after Miss Wood's unlawful death, Abel Miracol wrote a poem he named Strange Fruit. A poem against the evils of lynching, racism, and white supremacy. In the past, singers such as Billie Holiday and Nina Simone sang the words in sorrow. <clears throat> Today, I recite the words in strength. Mm -hmm. Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood at the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Pastoral scenes of the gallant South. The bulging eyes and the twisted mouth. Mm. Mm. Scent of magnolia, so sweet, so fresh. <clears throat> then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is fruit for the crows to pluck, for the wind to gather, for the rain to suck, for the sun to rot, for the trees to drop. Here is a, a strange and bitter crop. Mm. When I have been so moved by a program that I have been moved this afternoon. Before I tell you about the special joint committee I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to be in this place this time for this task. I grew up during the time when blacks and whites and many of you who are listening know what I'm talking about. We could only go to the zoo on Thursday. I lived in Memphis, Tennessee. I came from Arkansas, but that's another story. <laughs> because my father was uh, worked on a plantation, and uh, at the end of every year, when he'd go to get paid, he would be told, I don't owe you anything. <coughs> you owe me. And as I have uh, grown and interacted, I said, you know what? Servitude without compensation is slavery. So that's my beginning. And then I grew up in a society that treated me as if I was a nobody. And every time, I can tell you instances after and but every time I rode a bus, see, when you went to the zoo on Thursday, that everybody was like you. So you just accepted it. We could only go to the fair on Monday night. So everybody there looked just like me. But when I got on that bus, and I had to move to the back, 
I was reminded on a constant basis that somebody thought they were better than me. And I'll never forget my first lesson. I was seven years old and we had moved and I didn't want to change from the school I was attending. So we rode the bus and I had my brother with me. And we were sitting in the back because we knew where our place was. And this little white girl got on the bus about my age and said, Mama, look at all the niggas in the back. <laughs> that just pierced my soul. I said, something is wrong with me. And it's got to do with the color of my skin because the white folk are sitting up there and I'm sitting in the back. I could be here all day talking about why I am and who I am and how I got involved in the movement and the sit-in movement. When it came, I remembered riding on the back of that bus and I was ready. <laughs> I was an undergraduate from Lamorne Owen College. The school system told me when they interviewed me, you'll never be hired by the Memphis City Schools because you're a jailbird and you're a poor role model for the student. But thank God, thank God, I have proof that when the school system finally decided to hire me, the proof, Reverend Coleman, was a student in my class in Clue, which was a program for the gift. Every march Dr. King led during the sanitation strike, I was there. I was there on March 28, 1968, when the violence broke out. I had forced my young brothers to go with me, and every glass on Bill Street was shattered simultaneously. And I can remember the fear I had because I feared for my brothers' lives. They were 12 years old, and at that, that very day, a 15-year-old boy named Larry, uh, Larry, I've a senior moment, <laughs> Payne, Larry Payne, uh, was killed by the police. He had been sent to the store. He wasn't even in the, in the uh, march, but I knew. And it was the significance of that march, not only was the fear, but that was the march that forced Dr. King to come back a week later because he was organizing the Poor People's March and he had to prove that he could lead a peaceful march. If it had not been for March the 28th, 1968, he would not have been killed on April the 4th, 1968. Every speech he gave, I was there during that time. And on April the 3rd, 1968 at Mason Temple. I heard him give that prophetic message, I have been to the mountaintop. A prelude to what was going to happen to him the next day. And as it was said, I was also at the 1963 March on Washington when the Brotherhood Masterpiece I Have a Dream was delivered. So that's why I'm here. That's why I am, the, the, those who have preceded me, forgive me, that was magnificent. This show should be on the road. Our kids need to understand and know the trials and tribulations that we have gone through and the sacrifices that have been made. When I speak to school groups, sometimes they'll say, well, I wouldn't take that. I say, you don't have to take it now. I took it for you then. <laughs> And now, the task for which I just couldn't hold my peace any longer. I just couldn't. The Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Special Joint Committee, and I want to acknowledge Senator Jackson. He is one of the members, one of the very fine members of this committee. And it is Senator Jackson, along with the others, and along with each of you, that's going to make this come to fruition. It's going to be 
and we can make it so by contacting your legislators and tell them they must vote for this bill. On June the 6th, 2017, last year, Governor Haslam signed into law the Unsolved Civil Rights Crimes Special Joint Committee, three appointed from the House and three appointed from the Senate. And I couldn't work with a group, find a group of persons. Yours truly was elected as chair. Now the uniqueness of that is I'm a Democrat and I'm the only chair up there. <laughs> <laughs> but I got it any way you can get it, you got it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the group we have met, and I would like to, I would give you the names of the other members. Vice Chair, Senator Ed Jackson, Secretary, Representative Tim Rudd, Senator Thelma Hopper, Senator Mark Norris, who is carrying this bill for us in the Senate, and Representative Tillman Goins, and we have two excellent volunteers who have contributed so much to the success that we have to this point, and that is Attorney Jim Emerson, and I hope he's in the audience so he can be acknowledged for the great work he has done, and Attorney Alex Little. The two of them have formed a powerful coalition comprised of almost 50 different organizations and groups, university deans, and they have served to help us to hold the hearings that have led to not only the formation of the committee and the work because originally we were to cease existence on January the 15th, 2018. But unanimously, the committee felt the urgency, the need, it's, it's as if those who performed today had performed for them. But in a way, others had performed when they had come before us at the different hearings and shared their pain and their story. So, anonymously, unanimously, we just approached, we sent communications to the <coughs> Speaker of the House and the Speaker of the Senate and said, this work is too important, it is no way, there is no way we can accomplish this in six months. <coughs> and they created the committee we currently exist as, the special, the ad hoc task force to successor to the special joint committee. And we became in existence on January the 16th. So we haven't missed a beat. Now. <laughs> from what the observations and the testimonies that were given during from uh, in 2017, beginning with the reconvening of the General Assembly, these were the recommendations that the committee submitted. And at this moment, they are with our lawyers and we're asking them to draw up legislation that will help us to achieve the objectives as indicated in the findings that I will share with you. Number one, the General Assembly shall create a statutory commission to be known as the Tennessee Civil Rights Co Crimes Cold Case Commission, consisting of, and it gives each of the governor has to designate one or whatever. But this is what gives us the meat. Number one, among the tasks that we hope that this commission will be able to put in place, complete an independent statewide sur survey of unsolved civil rights crimes and determine the number and nature of those crimes. Number two, conduct an independent in investigation of those crimes to be able to refer them to appropriate state and our federal officials for prosecution. Number three, for crimes where prosecution is not feasible or appropriate, institute appropriate restorative justice measures. And number four, compile a report of your work, your findings and recommendations annually to the speakers of both chambers 
of the Tennessee General Assembly. You never move, one of the speakers before me said, you can never move past something until you acknowledge it. We're in the process through the hearings that we are being conducted to get <clears throat> Tennessee and eventually America to acknowledge the horror that has been inflicted upon a race of people simply because of the color of their skin. And with that being said, we hope that the next time we meet together, brothers and sisters, that each of these findings will be put into law so that that one day that we talk about when we pledge allegiance to the flag, there will be liberty, justice, and equality for all. All of you that wonder why I do what I do and why I say what I say. For all of you that have wondered why I have the passion that I have and why I never stop, it's because I'm the fruit of Johnny Turner. And when one is molded and inspired and poured into you all that she has, she's continued to allow her spirit to live in the spirit of others when She's given of herself so tirelessly. One could do no less. So today I thank God for hands of teachers like Johnny Turner Amen. who continue to mold and shape and move and touch and even now stand as the only Democratic chair <laughs> in the Tennessee State Assembly. For a teacher like that, I could do no less. I do thank Bob Rains and Harold Carter and Amira Graves for affording me this opportunity to share on this day. But I must admit that once they shared with me what we were doing, the question that hit my mind is why? Why would we dedicate soil to memorialize the horrific atrocities that were played upon innocent victims by the many minds that, in a perverted sense of justice, believed that they were doing what's right by killing innocent lives, shedding innocent blood, and doing it all as good citizens with moral character? Why? Yeah. Why would we dedicate soil to <laughs> memorialize those that represent over 4,000 persons who were publicly murdered, not counting those who privately were murdered, who stand as the most recent manifestation and iteration of the tremendous atrocity that occurred when six million African Ameri Africans were killed in the Middle Passage and thrown in the Atlantic Ocean? Why? Why would we come on this day to dedicate soil to memorialize lynching victims who stand as the vestige of the dark past and sordid history of a southern community that believed themselves to be Christian and thought themselves to be doing good? Why? Why would we come today to dedicate soil to memorialize lynching victims that died in the past when so many would say that we're only scratching off the scab and pouring salt in the wound of a sore we've been trying to heal for so long. So today as I prepare to collect thoughts and Look for a method to dedicate this song. The question that <coughs> came to my mind was why? 
But as I labored over that question, the thing that helped me to deal with today is, is that the reason why we come, the reason why we've gathered, the reason why the soil is here and the hour has come is because we must never forget because of people that forget their past yes. are doomed to repeat it in their future. We've come to dedicate soils to memorialize lynching victims because we recognize today that there's a resurgence of hatred and evil that's in the land. We see again new iterations of lynching and police killings and other unadjudicated murders of African American men and women across this nation. So we come to dedicate this soil lest we forget. Because Richard has already shared it, that God has told us that as we come through periods of our lives that there's a need to gather up things to remember. He told you the story. He shared that they took the stones and when they came to the camp that night, they set up the stones and they said in years to come, tell your children what these stones represent, lest they forget. For today I come to dedicate the soil in the name of Eliza Woods, lest we forget. I stand today to dedicate the soil in the name of John Brown, lest we forget. I come to dedicate the soil on behalf and in honor of Frank Ballard, lest we forget. But I come also today to dedicate this soil on behalf of the coming generations that they might know that there are things that we've done of which we cannot be proud. There are depths of depravity in our human nature that we sunk we must never sink to again, lest we forget. Lest we forget the hundreds of lives that are still victimized by those who enjoy in America what is known as white privilege. We dedicate the soil, lest we forget. We dedicate the soil in the midst of a region that still seeks to lift up a confederate flag in honor when it stands in disdain for so many who were enslaved, who were pillaged, and who were killed as others saluted that flag. Lest we forget. I dedicate this soil lest we forget how low we can sink, how bad humans can be, how callous we can act, and how unrepentant we can be when we refuse to acknowledge the sins of our past. I dedicate this soil that we might feel an urgency to continue to fight for justice, yeah. We might be inspired to move beyond where we are, to speak those words that we're afraid to say, to change those laws that we are afraid to change, to eradicate those barriers that we refuse to see, uh -huh. to unite those communities that we so scarcely drive through. I stand today to dedicate this soil so that we can realize that there should be freedom yes, and justice yes. for all. Yeah. So today we dedicate this soil. And hopefully a grain of this soil will remind us that we must fight for economic justice so that East Jackson and North Jackson can enjoy the same privileges. Yes. So we dedicate this soil. We dedicate this soil so that a sitting 
district attorney general. We'll continue to remember those wonderful words that he shared when he prepares to prosecute, to adjudicate. Yes, and remember that it is just as wrong for black skin to take lives as much as it is for white skin yes, to destroy lives. Yes, we dedicate this soil. We dedicate this soil today so that <clears throat> as it comes together, we might be together. And we might realize that never again shall we see the darkness of a segregated society. Uh -huh. Never again will we allow ourselves to judge others as a great artist said by the color of their skin rather than the content of their character. We dedicate this soil so that all of the lies that now have been taken and lived in an anonymous graves can be celebrated to realize that their blood stood for something to realize that their lives stood for something to realize that even though no one cared then that we care now and because of them our tomorrow will be better so I'm glad today to be a part of this ceremony as we dedicate this soil in the name of these individuals and prepare to place it with other individuals in a great monument so that when America looks at its history and prepares for its future, it can realize its atrocities and rise above them. And whatever we do, the names of Eliza Woods, John Brown, Franklin, Frank Ballard and countless others will never be forgotten. We dedicate this soil as a memorial of lynching victims, lest we forget. God bless you.
like to uh, place soil into the jars, which is in uh, the town of Alabama today. You're welcome to come to all of that as orderly as you can, or, or disorderly as you can. But anyone who wants to do that, there's a little extra. 